This video was sponsored by Let's Get Rusty. Today, we're going to explore how some of the most common terms in computer science trace their names back to the early history of computing. And trust me, once you know their origins, you'll never see these words the same way again. Especially that one function called print that we use all the time, even though no printer is involved. Hi friends, my name is George, and this is Core Dumped. Where does the term core dumped come from anyway? Back in the early days, engineers had to be very creative when building computer hardware, and memory was no exception. What you're watching right now is one of the first kinds of computer memory, widely used between the 1930s and the 1950s. These were called drum memory, and you can probably see why. The information was literally stored on a spinning cylinder made of magnetic material. But moving parts are always a limitation, so eventually this design was replaced with a completely electrical kind of memory. This is a RAM module from the mid-1950s. At its core, quite literally, it's a device made up of a large grid of tiny magnetic rings, also known as toroids, made from a hard magnetic material. This type of memory was called magnetic core memory because those little rings were also known as cores. A network of horizontal and vertical wires was woven through the array, placing one magnetic ring at every intersection. When a current passes through a core, it creates a circular magnetic field in it, either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the direction of the current. If the current is strong enough, the core retains a permanent magnetization. We can assign one direction to represent a zero and the other a one, and voila, we have a single bit of storage. This is probably my favorite piece of early computing technology, because you can literally see where each bit is being stored. Anyway, I bring up this piece of history because this is where the phrase core dumped actually comes from. Core dumped is that message that often shows up when our program crashes, usually due to memory errors. But what does it actually mean? Well, the actual message associated with memory problems is segmentation fault. Core dumped is actually a secondary message. As I explained in my video on signals, where we overwrote the default behavior of the key combination control C to make our program play a sound instead of terminating. Oh my God, okay, it's happening. Oh my God, okay, it's happening. Oh what makes a program stop when something goes wrong is actually a signal sent from the kernel. If you take a look at the Linux signals table, you'll see that the default action for some signals is just terminate, while for others it's terminate and dump core. I'll start by saying that a more appropriate name for this should really be dumping the memory. A dump file consists of the recorded state of the working memory of a computer program at a specific time, generally when the program has crashed or otherwise terminated abnormally. Dumping memory means that when something goes wrong, the operating system doesn't just terminate the process, it also makes a copy of the entire address space and saves it into a file on disk. Since this file contains an exact replica of the program's memory at the moment of the crash, it can later be used for figuring out what could have happened. And that's what core dumped means. The question now is, why core dumped? Why not something more descriptive like memory snapshot created, or process state saved, or just straight memory dumped? Well, let's go back to magnetic core memory for a moment. Since computing power was extremely limited back then, runtime debuggers weren't possible. One of the few ways to figure out what went wrong after a crash was to analyze the contents of memory at that moment, so programmers relied on dumping memory to debug problems. And here's our answer. Just like we refer to RAM as memory today, back then they informally referred to this kind of device simply as the core. And from these images, you can probably see why. So, as good programmers, they called that process of generating a dump file from the information contained by the magnetic core memory dumping the core. And that's where the phrase core dumped comes from. So, segmentation fault is the reason your program crashed, and core dumped is the operating system telling you that it saved a dump file, so you can use it later to figure out what went wrong, or, as we call it today, debugging. And by the way, where does the term debugging come from? Well, many people believe it comes from a moth. But before we get to that story, if you follow this channel, I'm pretty sure you love low-level systems, and that's exactly why I'm excited to tell you about Let's Get Rusty. There's no doubt big companies are betting big on Rust for building critical systems, 
Google, Microsoft, even the Linux kernel itself are now integrating Rust into their core systems. That's not hype. That's happening. And if you're thinking about leveling up your Rust skills, whether for personal growth or to land a job working on real systems, Let's Get Rusty is the go-to place for Rust training. Created by a fellow YouTuber and one of the most beloved names in the Rust online community, Let's Get Rusty has helped thousands of developers, myself included by the way, master the language and break into systems programming. They're running a new cohort very soon, and since spots are limited, now's a great time to check it out. Visit letsgetrusty.com slash startwithgeorge, or just click the link in the pinned comment below. Big thanks to Let's Get Rusty for supporting the channel. And now, back to the video. We all know modern computers are built with transistors, but back in the early days, before transistors were even invented, computers used much larger components, like vacuum tubes or relays. Remember, a transistor is basically an electronic switch. When you apply voltage to its base terminal, it lets electricity flow from the collector to the emitter. A relay works in a very similar way, but it uses mechanical parts. When you apply voltage to an internal coil, it turns into an electromagnet that attracts a piece of metal, closing the circuit and allowing electricity to flow. Since relays work through an electromechanical mechanism, there's a limit to how small they can be, and how fast they can switch. As shown in this letter that Thomas Edison wrote to an associate in 1878, the term bug to describe a defect has been part of engineering jargon since at least the 1870s, long before electronic computers or software even existed. But there's one particular story that made the word famous in the world of computer science. In 1947, U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Grace Hopper, a computer pioneer, was working on the Mark II computer at Harvard. During one run, the system started malfunctioning. The operators, who at that time literally played the role of a modern operating system, traced the error to a moth that had gotten trapped inside one of the relays. The moth was removed from the mechanism and taped in a log book with the note, first actual case of bug being found. A lot of people think that this is the origin of the term bug. But as you can see right here, the operators were familiar with the engineering term and were probably making a double entendre joke by mixing the biological bug with the technical bug. Still, the story became very popular, and it stuck. And that's why, even today, people, technical or not, refer to computer problems, crashes, or glitches as bugs. And of course, the act of fixing them became known as debugging. And speaking of fixing bugs, have you ever wondered why releasing a new version of software to replace a faulty one is called patching? Back in the day, when peripherals like screens and keyboards weren't really a thing yet, programmers had to input data in weird, primitive ways, usually through some kind of storage medium. One of those was the magnetic tape reel, which is actually where the terms mount and unmount come from, because you literally had to mount the tape onto the reader. That's why, even today, when dealing with storage devices, you'll still see reference to these terms in the UI. Another very common way of inputting information was through punch cards. These are actually very simple to understand. A punch card contained a grid, and some of the positions had holes. For simplicity, let's assume a hole represents a binary one, and a blank spot represents a binary zero. The computer would use special hardware with sensors to detect whether each position in the grid contains a hole or not, reading ones and zeros. When a punch card was used as program input, chances were high that it had been punched manually by a human. And since humans make mistakes, programs often crashed or gave wrong results due to errors in how the holes were punched. If you discovered that a bit should actually be a one, easy, you just punched a new hole. But if a bit should have been a zero, you couldn't unpunch it. The obvious fix would be to grab a blank card and punch the correct pattern all over again. But that was slow and tedious, especially for long sequences like punch tapes. So engineers came up with a quicker hack. They'd grab some tape and literally patch the hole, so the computer would read it as a zero instead of a one. If you look at old photos of punch cards or punch tapes, Chances are you find those weird little patches, visible proof of a human programming mistake that was literally fixed with tape, a software patch you could literally see. And even today, developers still release updates and fixes under that same name, patches. And that's where the term patching software comes from. I'd bet about 80% of you already knew some of these facts. <laughs>
but not all of them. If you've learned something, hit that like button. That helps a lot. And now, the question most of you are actually here for. Why would anyone call a function that displays characters on a screen print? You definitely don't need a printer for that. Once again, let's go back to the 1950s. As I mentioned before, there was a time when computers weren't really designed to interact with many devices. In the same way that for years information was input in strange ways, output devices weren't much better. In fact, punch cards could also be used to output information. But that meant the results of a program had to be manually translated into something more readable, and that took time. So eventually, engineers decided to find a better way to get human-readable information directly from the computer, and so they started using teletypes. Imagine you take one of those old typewriters and a printer and somehow make them have a baby. It sounds like a joke, but that's literally what a teletype was. Computers were connected to these machines. If you wanted to send a command, you'd type it on the keyboard, and two things happened with every keystroke. First, the teletype echoed it by printing the character on paper, just like a typewriter would. Sounds familiar, right? Second, that same keystroke was sent as electrical signals to the main computer. That's way more intuitive than punching holes on cards and hope you don't make a mistake. But here's the clever part. These machines could also print characters received from the computer. So when the computer wanted to output information, it could now literally print the result on paper. And that's why that function to output information to the user was called print. Some traces of that era still exist today. If you look at the first 32 entries in the ASCII table, you'll see they're not printable at all. They're called control characters. If a teletype received a number greater than or equal to 32, it printed the character tied to that number. But if it received a number lower than 32, it triggered a mechanical action instead. For example, character 13, carriage return, move the carriage back to the start of the line. Character 10, line feed, rotated the platen so the paper advanced to the next line. Horizontal and vertical tabs were handled in a similar way. Over time, teletypes became more electrical and less mechanical, but they still had one big drawback, paper. Hands down to Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, who built Unix using teletypes. Meanwhile, I've got a MacBook with way more RAM than they ever dreamed, and I still can't finish my side projects. Oh my God, okay, it's Eventually, teletypes were replaced by machines called dumb terminals, which worked exactly like teletypes, except they displayed text on a screen instead of printing it on paper. At first, these weren't sophisticated at all. They were basically teletypes with a screen, still relying on the same control characters to move the cursor around. The word cursor, by the way, comes from the Latin cursus, which literally means running. Cursor was originally the name given to the transparent sliding marker on a slide rule used to track movement across the scale. So if you ever wondered about that, now you know the inspiration. Anyway, that's also how we ended up with those special, unprintable characters that still exist today. By the 1970s, nearly all teletypes had been replaced by dumb terminals. If you look at photos from that era, you'll see them everywhere. And the term terminal still survives today. The programs we use to type commands into our computers are called terminal emulators, because they literally emulate those old devices that once were the main way to communicate with a computer via commands. Now, before we continue with the final part, I just want to explain why terminals are often also called consoles. Just like pilots have a console to monitor and control an aircraft, and nuclear power plants have a console to oversee the reactor core, early computers also had their own console, a massive panel covered with switches and indicator lights used to start, stop, and monitor the machine. In the 1960s, when teletypes appeared, they quickly started replacing those giant panels. Systems could now be controlled by sending commands and printing messages directly, instead of flipping switches and watching lights. The name, however, stayed the same. These setups were known as console typewriters. When dumb terminals arrived in the 1970s, they took over that same role. And once again, the term console stuck, even though the hardware had changed completely. So originally, console referred to the interface used to control a system, while terminal was the specific device acting as that console. I'd like to highlight that these terms existed because of the ridiculous size of the actual computers back then, and the need to have a dedicated control panel to handle such massive machines. <laughs> 
But as time went on and computers got smaller, it became harder to point to a single physical part and call it the console. Still, you can clearly see how the terms console and terminal evolved over time, converging into the software interface we developers use today to control our computers via commands. Regarding the print function, some of you might be wondering why, once terminals came out, nobody bothered to update the name to something more descriptive. I mean, if I had to name a function that shows characters on a screen, I'd probably call it display, without a doubt. And yeah, that's a valid question. Personally, I'd say there are two main reasons the term stuck around all the way to today. The first one is simply practicality. When you have a huge code base, it's usually not worth changing the name of a function that's already used thousands of times across the code. And remember, this was the 1960s and 70s. There were no IDEs, no automatic refactoring tools, no find and replace all shortcuts. If you wanted to rename a function, you had to manually edit every single place in the code where that function was called. So yeah, changing print to something like display wasn't just tedious, it was risky. But above all, the main reason was what I like to call the transition period. When terminals appeared, teletypes weren't replaced overnight. There was a period where both coexisted, teletypes becoming less common while terminals gradually took over. In this photo I showed before, you can see a PDP-11 computer in the background that could be operated using both dumb terminals and teletypes. Now, the idea of a screen compared to paper might make us think of something more advanced. After all, we're used to high-resolution displays. But back then, dumb terminals were called dumb for a reason. They weren't sophisticated at all. All they could do was receive characters and show them on the screen, the same way teletypes received characters and printed them on paper. To the main computer, there was no real difference between the two. So during that period, programmers had a bit of a naming problem. Keeping the name print felt inaccurate for users on terminals, but renaming it to display would have made it inaccurate for users still using teletypes. And by the time terminals finally replaced teletypes completely, it was too late. The word print had already become synonymous with outputting text to the user, not necessarily printing it on paper. And let's wrap things up for now. I was planning to end this video talking about the term buffer, which actually comes from those train tools called buffer stops. But since I'm planning to make a whole video about buffers, I'll save that one for a future episode. So you guys be safe. I'll see you in the next one.